Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm going to talk to you today about triaging exotics. So if you're watching this video, you're probably have already been triaging patients. And um, the reason we're doing this video separately is because triaging exotic patients is actually a lot different than triaging your typical cats and dogs. And I think that this is kind of a higher level critical thinking triage um, and can be quite difficult if you don't know the right questions to ask. So the first thing I try to keep in mind is that if any exotic patient comes in as a sick animal patient um, or to urgent care or the ER, you need to assume that they're really sick. Owners don't notice disease in exotic species until it's quite advanced. And that's because um, Naturally, these exotic animals mask their illness really, really well, and that's because um, in the wild, they have to mask those illnesses in order to avoid predation. Um, most of our exotic species, um, even things like big rabbits, are prey animals, so keep that in mind. And owners can be really quite astute to cats and dogs and may notice little bit little changes here and there. But by the time that an exotic animal stops eating, they're usually really, really sick. And they can actually be really, really sick and still hopping around or flying around and even still eating. So keep that in mind that our typical cues of not eating and lethargic aren't the typical first cues in exotic patients. So when I'm triaging exotic patients, the first thing I do is try to visually assess them and their housing. So often, People will bring in an animal like a rabbit or a ferret or a bird and they may just be holding it because it wasn't moving much at home. But with a little bit of um, kind of like environmental stimulation and um, excitement, they may perk up a little bit. The adrenal of it, adrenaline might make them more mobile um, or look like they're feeling better. But because of this, I never will transport an animal into the building or from room to room in a building without a safe cage. So they may have their own cage and I wanna make sure that that isn't something that can open up unexpectedly. Um, or if they're not in a cage using something like, you know, a cardboard box or a travel cat carrier or even a pillowcase for some reptiles is a really safe way to make sure you're moving throughout the building. So once you've assessed their housing to make sure that that is safe, um, the other thing I do is I just you know, while I'm introducing myself, I'm watching the animal. And I'm doing that, when I'm, when I'm watching that animal, I'm looking for general mentation. Are they alert and responsive? How are they breathing? Not only like what rate are they breathing at, but what is the depth of their breathing? Is that appropriate? You may be able to tell if they're weak because they can't hold their head in normal posture um, or they're not standing or holding their bodies in a normal position. Maybe like with reptiles, they're not correctly positioning their limbs. Um, that type of general thing I like to assess while they're still with their owners. Um, and once I do this kind of really quick, maybe like 10 second visual assessment, you know, and I've asked their names and I make sure the housing's okay, I start getting into the depth of the questions that I want to um, obtain this history from the clients. And I don't want a full history that can be really an enormous amount of information depending on the owner you're talking to. So there's a little bit of an art to it is getting good quality information, but not starting, you know, 25 years ago when they got their bird as a hatchling. I really want to know kind of the recent history and environmental considerations. And I start asking questions that I don't typically ask for dogs and cats, or not at least always ask. So I start asking questions like, what is your pet's typical diet? Um, and this is really important. Um, these, all these questions are really important because exotic species illness is typically related to um, environmental husbandry and nutritional deficiencies that are usually inadvertently um, delivered by the owner. And that's because they're getting these exotic pets that have some really specific requirements that they're not always aware of. Um, and, and in general, I think exotic patients are less likely to have routine veterinary care, making client education um, maybe a little bit more minimal but than other cats and dog situations. So I start with diet. I say, what is your pet eating? What is their normal diet? 
Um, is it, you know, like if they're a reptile, is it alive? Are they feeding off of live animals or frozen? For birds, are they eating a seed or a pellet? Are they eating fresh fruits and veggies and that's multiple species? And then also has, have there been any changes to their diet? And those couple questions can give you some really key information. I also then like to ask them about um, potential like toxin exposure. So just like, you know, our dogs and our cats, um, exotic species can get into things that they shouldn't. So if you take your bearded dragon outside with you, are there different plants that they were around um, or um, potentially plants or bugs? Um, birds, some of the toys are, have some toxins in them, or even their cages themselves can lead to something like lead poisoning, um, which is a very common emergency. And so I like to ask about um, potential toxin exposure. House plants can be kind of a big, um, big concern that owners aren't really aware of. Um, the other things I like to ask them about is the environment that they're around. So are they housed with other animals? Just like cats and dogs and humans, exotic species are susceptible to like kind of communicable diseases. Um, or if you recently got them from something like a breeder or a pet store, there could be some sort of viral infection going on. Um, viral respiratory infections are, are really common in these species. So asking about the environment um, that they came from or that they're housed in is really important. And then I extend that to talking about their cage setup. Is it big enough? Is it have the appropriate light source and heat source um, available that they need um, for their minimum requirement requirements? There are some reptiles that are so susceptible to even small variations in their heating um, that if they have something like a blown fuse in their house and their heat went out for you know six hours, that pet may start regurgitating or become lethargic and they can be really sensitive um, to even small changes. So it's really important we know what kind of light they have um, and what kind of heat sources they have. All these things are really important tools to get even on primary triage because there isn't, it isn't as easy in exotic animals to say, oh, I think this is going on like in dogs or cats. That assumption isn't there. So if we can collect these pearls from the owner of these core kind of husbandry and nutritional um, environmental worlds that is around these exotics, it can be really beneficial to the doctors as they start their exam and start moving forward to figuring out what's going on with these patients. So those are the considerations for triaging exotic patients.